Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 766, that is set. Siete seis seis, I think. Siete seis seis. What's going on? What's cracker lacking? Welcome back to the Agassino Zinga Show. I hope you are well wherever this lovely, beautiful, gorgeous live stream may find you and this podcast and this show, wherever you're watching it. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Hope you're all doing well. Hope you're doing fantastic. I've had a really great morning, a really great day. I've been spending most of it watching loads of mad clips of AFTV, watching loads of Arsenal fans lose the plot in disbelief that they're knocked out of Champions League. I think Arsenal fans are more surprised they're knocked out than Man City fans, which is weird because Man City fans played the better football against Real Madrid and they were just really unlucky in that they couldn't convert their chances. Real Madrid defended really well. And when it got to penalties, you know, unfortunately penalties are one of those type of things. But Arsenal fans seem to be almost, they almost feel entitled to have gone through against Bayern Munich. It's a strange, they're a strange bunch, Arsenal fans. They're up there with the Ars- with Liverpool fans. Like They're a very odd bunch. They think the football world revolves around them. They think they are deserving of trophies. They think they are football royalty. It's just a very bizarre group of people. But I've been enjoying watching their tears. I've been enjoying drinking their tears to some level, as you can hear from this bottle of water that I have in my hand. It's been a really fun day. I'm not going to lie. It's been a fun day. It's the only fun we can have as a United fans. United are in the mud at the moment. So the only bit of fun that we can have is laughing at our rivals. That's the only thing we can. That's how damn bad we are. United are so damn bad. That I'm now, I've become the fan that I always hated. I've become the person that I always hated. The kid, the guy, the fan that would laugh and that would celebrate and that would get some sort of joy out of their nearest and bitterest rivals going through a hard time. In some cases, there are fans out there who get more joy out of their rivals losing and being disappointed and being let down than their own team winning. And that's where I'm getting at because I feel like with United, we are nowhere close to getting to where we need to get to. We're never going to get back to the promised land until the whole club is sold. And that's never happening. The Glazers are going to be here until they die. And even then, they'll probably pass it on to their children. They're never leaving United ever, ever. It's too much of a gravy train. It's too much of an easy gravy train. It's too easy to take dividends from the club. It's too easy to just coast along and, you know, expense everything on the company card, chauffeur driven, you know, nice flights and shit. You get the fucking blazer with the Man United crest on your chest to walk around and feel like you're doing something. It's too easy. Why would they give it up? Why would they do that? So we're, we're fucked for a long term. So if we're effed we're for a long term, you know what I'm going to do? Bitch, you guessed it. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to smile. I'm going to have a jolly good time at seeing my rivals go through it. So Arsenal and Man City, hold that. Okay? Hold that. I've also been thinking quite a lot. I've also been thinking quite a lot. Guess what I've been thinking about quite a lot about? The Drake track. I still can't get over it. I still can't get over Drake push-ups. I really can't. And I'm thinking to myself, what are these guys getting up to behind the scenes? What are these guys getting up to in private that would drive J. Cole, a legit MC, a student of hip hop, somebody that studied the greats, somebody whose whole life he's been prepping for this moment, right? He's always wanting to get signed. He always wanted to get put on. He always wanted to prove how great of a rapper he is. And he waved the white flag before a real bomb, a real jab, a real hook was thrown his way. He got a slight little nudge, right? He got a slight little push of the shoulder and he immediately waved the white flag what could these guys getting up to in secret because the reason i say that is because i have a feeling j cole didn't bow out of the rave or didn't bow out at the fucking beef because he doesn't feel like he's as good as an mc as those guys i think he bowed out because he's worried about those guys exposing his secrets that's the main reason why he bowed out i swear to god i've got a feeling that j cole only bowed out of the beef between Kendrick and Drake and everybody else because he was afraid of the public finding out what makes his dick go hard. Bizarre, but I swear that's the truth. Oh, so good. Look, I could never be nobody number one fan. Mm. Your first number one, I had to put it in your hand. Mm. You pussies can't get put outside America for now. Mm. Because I'm big in Japan. 
you know what's funny in the first 20 seconds of this tune drake talks about being booked abroad being a big star making loads of money this is one of the weirdest rap beefs ever because there's nothing tying this to the streets there's no gang stuff involved there's no one snitching there's no one dying no attempted hits nobody getting rushed at the club nothing this is purely a rap beef between guys who feel like Drake needs to be taken off his pedestal. They're fed up. It, I almost feel like this record is an expression of Drake also being fed up of feeding people. He feels like, because it must be an odd position to be in. Think of it this way, right? Think about if you're Drake. Think about your Drake, but you don't have the attitude of what a Drake should be like. Like imagine this scenario. Hear me out, right? Imagine a scenario where Drake happens to be the number one rapper in the world, number one hip-hop artist in the world, right? But he doesn't have the ego of the number one hip-hop artist in the world. Like, he kind of carries himself like a regular guy, right? Now, then imagine the regular guy feeling as if the people around him that he deems to be his friends, I wasn't taking advantage, but they're, like, overusing their favours. They're overly going to him all the time for, like, you know help on this jump on a song blah 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 you kind of feel like they're taking advantage of you but you're not really too sure because you're also the main guy you kind of feel obliged to kind of reach back and give back so you're in a weird position but then on the other side i almost feel it like here's an analogy i feel of it forget that what i said that was waffle this now this is the better analogy i feel like drake is the kind of person where like this situation is equivalent to you know when they say don't lend your friends a lot of money because sometimes they'll end up despising you for the fact that they had to ask you for that money. You know? I think that's what's basically happened. I think Drake is so big, pause, <laughs> yeah, oh no, did he, that his fellow peers are now upset that they have to go to him for like a stimulus package. They don't like the fact that they have to go to him for it. And they don't like the fact that every time they go to him for it, they get a top five record or number one. So clearly he follows through on his promises and clearly he is that guy. So it makes you feel doubly insecure because now you're really, you're in a position where you're like, oh damn, I'm not really the guy I thought I was. So it's a really strange beef. No road stuff, no gang stuff, no violence. It's just a pure beef of like egos, jealousy and envy. He fucks all my bitches or he fucks all the, because I, I bet that's the thing too with the guy's ego. I bet it's a thing where how a lot of guys are, where you never claim somebody. You want to act cool, right? So you never let it be known that you're into somebody. Drake then picks them up. Now you get pissed off. It's like, but you never let him know that he was into that person. You try to act too cool. You try to act like you weren't bothered. Then obviously when Drake comes along, it's a fucking rap, right? It's like the famous fucking Asap Bari quote about Rocky. When Drake comes around, it's a fucking rap. So you know that's already gone. Or maybe he just picks up your scraps and bangs them anyway and you still get pissed off. But either way, it's a strange beef. I feel like it's all centered around money and girls. No gang stuff. No one snitching. No one getting shot. No one getting killed. No one getting stabbed. No one getting stomped out. Zero. Just snitching. Sorry. Just, uh, just kissing and money. Kissing, fucking and money. That's what this beef is about. Wild. I'm the hit maker, y'all depend on Tough on record in my city, it was friend zone You won't never take no chain off of us How the fuck you been stepping with a size 7 men zone This the bark with the bike, nigga, what's up? I know my picture on the wall when y'all took a extortion. By the way, that was very inside information I know your picture's on, my, on your wall when you cook up That's very inside information That's almost as if like He knows somebody that's been in their studios and has seen their mood boards, their inspiration walls, and they've actually seen Drake's picture on those mood boards. That's what it feels. That feels very specific to mention, you know, which is funny. You're beefing with somebody. You don't like somebody, but then you've also got a picture of them on your wall. I could never do that. I could never be inspired by someone I don't like. If I don't like somebody, I'm wishing death on them. Do you know what I mean? I want them to get hit by a lorry. I want them to, you know, to flipping, um, you know, to get some sort of like horrible disease that kills them slowly like there's nothing that i want from them at all zero zero but this is a funny little tactic from drake here baby hope for real you've been shook up this top so you drop and give me 50 like some push-ups huh, your last one by the way if you believe kendrick lamar weighs a size nine i have a timeshare to share you 
If you believe Kendrick Lamar, his size could be a US 9, I have some fucking a Mars rock to sell you. If you believe that Kendrick Lamar is a size 9. Come on. You really not on shit. They make excuses for you because they hate to see me lit. Pull your contract because we got to see the split. Hey, the way you doing splits, bitch, your pants might rip. You better do that motherfucking show inside the bitty. Maroon 5 need a verse, you better make it witty. Then we need a verse for the Swifties. Top say dry, you better drop and give them 50. Pip squeak pipe down, you ain't in no big three. Scissor got you white down, Travis got you white down, Savage got you white down. Like your label boy, you in a scope right now. And you gon' feel the aftermath of what- And I like the little shout out to Travis because he still hates Travis, but I like the little shout out of like, yeah, you think you're big, but like Scissor outsells you. Travis outsells you. How big are you really? But I think a lot of it comes down to, I think Drake has always had a disdain for these guys because they take too much time off. Even J. Cole. They take too long of a breaks in between, but yet they're still debated in the same sentences and the same debates as Drake. And it's like, no, I'm competing. Like Drake probably in his mind is like, I'm having to compete against Yeet. I'm competing against Destroy Lonely, against fucking, you know, whoever else, whoever, Carti. Like I'm competing with these kids coming up who are like really going for my jugular. And yet these guys can take five year breaks, come back and do some, you know, airy fairy shit right or as, as or as dj Khaled would say some mysterious shit and then they get regarded on the same level as me it's like nah that isn't the vibe right now right down i'm at the top of the mountain so you tight now just ahead is talk with your ass i had to hike down big difference between mike and mike yeah and drake does hate travis by the way um i see some comments here drake hates travis because if i remember correctly before like that came out so before the metro and future album came out we didn't know like that was on the album we didn't know like that existed and in one concert, I think it was before Coachella, there was a concert they did where Travis told Metro Boomin, play that, like that record, play again, play again, play again. He kept hyping it. We didn't know what it was though. They didn't really say, but he kept hyping it. He kept like acting as if like he wanted to hear it. I want to hear that diss again. So I think Travis is like picked his side as well. So Travis is definitely on more so Metro and Future side, which makes sense considering the Kanye thing, the Drake thing, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, um, Drake probably knows that Travis is on that side, so it keeps him at arm's length, I would, I would assume. What the fuck is this, a 20v1, nigga? What's a prince to a king? He a son, nigga. I get more love in the city that you from, nigga. Metro, shut your whole ass up and make some drums, nigga. That's one of my favourite lines. Metro, shut your whole ass up and make some drums, nigga. Because, unfortunately, as much as I love Metro Boomin, he is a pretty annoying follow on social media. Recently, he allegedly got hacked, and that's why he said all those things during a rollout of "We don't trust you." And he walked it's like, "Bruh, just leave us alone, man. We don't care. Leave us alone." You probably would have been better off not telling us that. It didn't make any difference, really. We don't give a fuck. Yeah, I'm a six guy. I'm a front runner. Y'all nigga manage your. And I also love the fact that none of these guys have ever said exactly what their problem is with Drake. You know why? Because they know it's redacted. They know it's a dumb reason to not like him. And they know it obviously will make them look more insecure than ever. Because guys do it all the time. Where you pretend like you're not really into you're not, you're not really into somebody. Or you pretend like you're not really that bothered, but you are bothered. But you don't want to show that you are bothered. You want to always maintain like you don't give a fuck. So they're never going to say exactly what their issue is. But I have a feeling the issue isn't that deep. You know? Drake calling Kendrick a midget is fucking funny, by the way. It's such an old school insult. You never hear people say that anymore because obviously it's not politically correct, but it's a funny diss. Drop and give me 50. Niggas really got me out here talking like I'm 50. Ay. Niggas really got me out here rapping what I'm living. I might take it latest girl and cuff her like I'm Ricky. Can't believe he jumping in this nigga turning 50. Every song that made it on the chart he got from Drizzy. Worry about whatever going on with you and Hey, shout out to the Hooper that be busting out the gritty. I know why you mad, nigga. I ain't even tripping. I ain't even rapping after this. I'm way too busy. This for all the top dogs. Drop and give me 50. Drop, drop. In that fucking song, y'all got his not starting beef with us. This 
shit being brewing in a pot, now I'm heating up. I don't care what cold think that dot shit was weak, weak as fuck. fuck. Champagne tripping, he is not fucking eating up. Nigga caught a top to see a top one, piece it up. Top one, piece it up. Top one, a piece it up. Nah, pussy, now nah, you on your own when you speaking up. Ooh! <laughs> He's too good. He's too good. He's too good, bro. He's too good. Top one to piece it up, yeah? Nah, you're on your own now. What? PG, LPG? Stay over there, man. You're on your own now. No top dog to protect you. Know what I mean? None of the Crips to protect you. None of the Hubris to protect you. None of the blood to protect you. You're on your ones. You and Baby Keem. You and Baby Keem. You know what I mean? The hairline kids, right? The pushback hairline kids. You and Baby Key, I've got each other now. Good luck. You don't roll deep to this. It's not fucking deep enough. Oh. They ain't costing not where you not fucking beating up. Oh. I'm out of here. You not fucking creeping up. Oh. I'm out of here. You not fucking sneaking up. Oh. Money, money, merch, money, feed us. I'ma let you niggas work it out because I've seen enough. This ain't even everything I know. Don't wake the demon up. This ain't even everything I know. Don't wake the demon up. Drop and give me 50. I'll oh, fuck up. niggas teaming up. What? What? Teaming up with all of y'all, falling like some dominoes. Bros turning hoes, dog, like I ain't got enough of those. I can't wait to see how far you niggas get, get to reach it now. This the closest thing you niggas getting to a feature now. By the way, him mentioning this, this is the closest thing you're gonna get to a feature, is proof that he knows the value of their friendship. He probably knew from a while ago, these guys aren't really his friends. They're only his friends because they want features. So this is the value. He's like, okay, cool. Now you want to come at me? Cool. No more features. It's not like he's saying we're not going to hang anymore. No more Sancho Pay. No more Bart's. No more this. No, he's saying, okay, your water's been turned off. Because he knows that's all they really value. And that's going to hurt them the most. Because once the, the dust settles and everything gets back to being cool, he's still not going to be cool. You know, that's the really hard part. When the public moves on to the next thing, you know, they're still going to be static with these guys. Still going to be static. That's a really unpleasant thing when it comes to beef, you know? But hey, it is what it is. Backpedal gang, cause a few of y'all been reaching out. Y'all drew the line. What the fuck we gotta speak about? Exactly. Get your fucking head tap, you niggas get to peeking out. You had get a song for tapped. four years, drop that shit and shut your mouth. mouth. Shut your mouth, nigga. It's me twice in my big three, I had to leave you out. It's me twice in my big three, I had to leave you out. Oh, J. Cole, you're done. You loser. J. Cole, you loser, you're done. You wanted out of the beef because you was afraid someone will find out what makes your pee pee hard. Now look what's happened. Huh? You're done. Big up Drizzy. Love to see it. You know what's funny though? You know who actually gave him some bars back and actually pushed him a bit? And he's really going toe to toe with him when it comes to the meme war. Bitch, you guessed it, Rick Ross. Rick Ross is actually doing really well. Rick Ross's memes and Rick Ross's banter online is actually better than the record. The record he did in less than two hours, salute to him. He turned that around in less than two hours, salute, right? And even the end bit was probably the funniest bit, right? But just in general, him sowing the seeds of doubts in people's mind that Drake got a nose job, the BBL thing, um, the line about how you how you 25% body fat, but you got a six pack, right? <laughs> like, honestly, Rick Ross is fucking funny. Really fuck. They're going joke for joke, bar for bar, really well. He actually is doing a, a lot better than I expected. I'm actually more curious to see how the beef back to back, you know, the banter between Drake and Rick Ross progresses as opposed to Kendrick. The Kendrick stuff's like, eh, you know, whatever. Um, especially now he's taking so long to reply. But I actually like how Rick Ross is approaching it. Rick Ross did well. He he understood the internet. He gets what people want to hear. He didn't go super serious and aggro in the fucking diss record. He just replied back and obviously set his tent, set, set his kind of level. And then since then, he's been on a meme war, right? Who can out funny the funniest? And I really enjoyed it. Rick Ross has done really fucking well. Rick Ross has done really, really, really well. Um, So I'm really curious how that develops. But a shame we won't get any more. Aston Martin music, no more Aston Martin music for us. Unfortunately, coming forward, no more Aston Martin music, which is a shame, isn't it? What can you do though? What can one do? So, moving on from that one, let's go on to some topics regarding the T A Z Z. So, number one topic to talk about 
I saw this clip on Twitter and I thought it was really interesting because this goes to speak to something that I've noticed already in London, which is becoming this trend of parties starting at like 12 p.m. So obviously drum sheds is a big place that does it because there's a big massive 10,000, you know, capacity venue. Um, uh, Fold has an unfold night on the Sundays they do from 12. Um, and there's a few other off parties too that do the whole afternoon thing. And the old premise behind it is this. London has some really horrible licensing laws. So a lot of the nightclubs in London can't stay open until, can't stay open past 2 to 4 a.m. Some clubs have special licenses or some clubs just have longer opening times, one of them being Fold and obviously Fabric and maybe a couple of others in London. But for the most part, most nightclubs in London close at like 2 a.m., 4 a.m. So because of that, clubs now are having to be a bit more creative in how they open. So some are opening at midday and then having the rave run all the way until, you know, midnight or 1 a.m. So you can get essentially 13, 14 hours of raving in if, you know, if time permits. But me personally... I think the idea of leaving my house at 9 a.m., 10 a.m. to go to a party that starts at 12 is insane. Like, I don't know why that makes sense. I don't know why that's cool. I don't know why that's lit. I don't know why that's Gucci. That sounds like a fucking nightmare. Getting ready, showering on a Saturday to go to a rave at 12 is just fucking insane. I don't want to do that. Anyway, some kids do. Now there's a party this guy went to, I'm showing you now on Twitter, that starts at 9 a.m., this is a bit further forward, right? A bit more crazy than what we're used to. So not 12. This is now 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Imagine how insane this is. But I have a feeling this trend most likely will continue on in the UK. I have a feeling it will pick up in the UK. Someone's going to try and do this in the UK because you could get a lot more hours in. And obviously you can pack out the venue. And obviously, you know, most venues would love to have people in at 9 a.m. raving until fucking 9 p.m. It makes their job far easier. So here this guy's account of how it is to rave from 9 a.m. in the morning. What's up, it's your boy JJ. This is my first 9 a.m. party. Um, I'm going to be taking y'all through it. And I'm going to be taking y'all through how I do it. And uh, the intoxication, how I'm doing it at 9 o'clock in the morning. Y'all stay tuned. walking into the venue music's are playing the bar is popping over people are kinda it's not full at all it's, it's basically half empty he's having a good time though Now it's, it's, it's actually filling up. It's actually filling up. It's actually filling up. There's some fucking psychos that are pretty much okay with partying at 9 a.m. in the morning. Can you imagine how insane you have to be to rave at 9 a.m. in the morning? And not like 9 a.m. like a Bergheim thing or like a Berlin thing or like any other European city, right? This is like the party starts at 9. Fucking hell. Looks fun though. Looks kind of fun. Uh, uh, it's called R and B at nine a.m. That's a party. It's called R and B at nine a.m. So I guess it's a brand of parties. And again, I can see this taking off in London. This could definitely take off in London. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. But imagine going home hungover, turn up at like six p.m. Or not, or like, it's just too much. Your heart bouncing inside of your chest at like what, 6, 7, 8 p.m.? When are you gonna go to bed? 4 a.m. the next day? 5, 7? Like, god Yeah, big up um, Abe Martinez. Um, I'm going to check all the Super Chats at the end of the pod. So anything that comes through, I'll shout them out at the end. I'll shout them out all at the end. But big up um, Abe Martinez. Appreciate you. I see you. 14 hour shifts. Thank God I've got you for four hours a day. Exactly. Big up Abe Martinez. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. But I'll shout out all of them at the end of the, at the, end of the stream. I guarantee I'll shout them all out at the end of the stream. Big up. Big up. Big up. <laughs>
Wow, it's actually four. I'm confused. I'm shocked. Ram. Anyway, you get the gist. You know what though? As great as this is, I would much rather see clubs just open longer. I'm sure this is going to take off in London. I'm sure somebody's going to start doing this in London. Someone will see this and it'll definitely take off here for sure because we have clubs that just don't stay open long enough. But I'd much rather they build or they open way more 200 capacity to 500 capacity clubs and have them open longer, maybe 4 a.m., maybe 6 a.m. if you can stretch it, so that we have more options as opposed to having parties start at 9 in the fucking morning. Especially with British people, English people, we're fucking liabilities anyway. We're fucking drunks as it is. Having people that turn at nine in the morning onwards, it just reps his recipe for disaster. I can't imagine that ending well in any way, shape or form. So as great as this party is, as great as this incentive is, as great as this is as a new direction, I personally would like to see more clubs um, of a mid, small to mid level size less 1000 plus capacity sorry and more clubs of this kind of size so that we can have clubs open later in the morning as opposed to opening them super early in the morning that's what i would much prefer but again what do i know moving on we have this picture courtesy of twitter that features the one and only matthew welty wearing a pair wearing a pair of joe Freshgood new balance 1000s that are coming out i think today or yesterday whenever it will be right I'm wondering, did Joe Freshgood set up Matthew Welty? Did he set him up? Because this guy has the most, like, again, no offense or anything, but he has the most jump scare worthy face I've ever seen. Why does he look like that when he smiles? Why is he grimacing like that? And why does he have that t-shirt on? Why does he have those jeans on with those shoes? Like, he has made these shoes that are really cool, incredibly uncool, with this, like, dad fit, this, like, youth pastor that also you know tickles little kids feet allegedly fit like what the fuck is this why is he pulling that face why does he have this t-shirt on with those jeans with those shoes does he know who that person is on his t-shirt did he buy that merch just to kind of be funny isn't he meant to be a christian why is he got, like I don't, I don't know what the fuck is this all about i'm very 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 confused about all of this stuff i don't understand this so i'm wondering did joe fresh could set him up did Joe Freshgood set up Matthew Welty, give him a pair of these New Balance 1000s and in an, in, you know, as a, as a seeding thing, but now he's made them really uncool and he stirred a bit of conversation because the shoes are amazing. The shoes are fucking gorgeous. As you can see, he's got these, um, I think they're like a pinky salmony color. They also come in this really nice black colorway as well that I like. That's similar to like the Skepta Air Max 97s. This is my favorite color. This kind of like, um iridescent purpley type of color with the gum sole it's fucking gorgeous but as you can see the product shots of these new balance 1000s are incredibly different right these when things were pure pack um new balances are very different to when matthew welty wears them they don't look as good on him so i don't know if this is a psyop if this is um you know an undercover thing but i don't know when i see that face with that little jump scare wearing those shoes i immediately don't want them I don't want them now. I see this face. I don't want them. I see the way he's oddly holding his, his phone. Like, I don't know why his, his phone, his fingers are like in that position when he's taking a picture. It's almost like he can't like, why don't you just like, hold, like I don't know. Like, what's, what's with that hands? Like, did something happen to his hand? Did he get chewed up in a lawnmower or something? And he's like half paralyzed or something. What's going on? Why is his fingers that way? Why can't you just hold it normally and take a picture? And why does he have black t-shirt with light jeans and light shoes? I don't know. It's all over the place. It's giving Nike talk. Um, it's giving wah wah wee wee. Whatever it's giving, I don't like it. And if anything, it's make me not like a really nice pair of shoes that I probably should be trying to get. But because Matthew Welty's wearing them, I don't want them anymore. But they do look lovely though, to be fair. I can't lie. They do look fucking lovely. Joe Fresh Goods does a fucking incredible job at, at New Balance. Um, if that guy from... Emilion Dior ends up leaving. 
creative director role. <clears throat> Sorry. I can definitely see Joe Freshko's taking over creative direction role, no balance, because he does a really good job there. He does a really fucking good job. So big up Joe Freshgoods. Um, obviously, don't big up Matthew Welty because, you know, that fit, that face, it's just a bit tough. But either way, either fucking way, we kind of keep it moving. We kind of keep it moving. Talking about keeping it moving, I had this idea, right, and I'm going to throw it out there so that, you know, there's a record of it. But I was browsing the Amelion' Door store, right? I was browsing the Amelion Door store as you as one does, even though my budget can't probably extend to seventy dollar baseball caps and hundred dollar ashtrays and shit, right? I was browsing Amelion Door, seeing seeing all the amazing stuff they have on their website. I scroll down and they have this great t-shirt. This t-shirt that says Queen's Crest Loafer t-shirt, right? And I was thinking to myself, wow, I had the same idea. But instead of having a pair of loafers, like, you know, imagine this is like a tribute t-shirt. So it's a regular crew neck. It's a regular kind of, you know, cotton t-shirt that you know and love. And on the back, they've got a print of a penny loafer, right? And I had this, I had a similar idea that I sketched up on my Photoshop of a tribute tee or like a whatever tee that was a DJ one. So it had a pair of Pioneer CDJs, a Pioneer DJM mixer whatever like a regular setup so the idea behind it would be if you're a vinyl dj you'd have like you know two turntables two technic turntables and maybe a vestac mixer but it would just kind of be like a thing and in the front it would have djing or dj or something in the middle right or just that was that was kind of flip i had in my head and when i saw this i was like oh shit that's the same sort of idea so because i've seen this on this site i'm now going to say this in public just so i have record of it that I'm now going to do a flip of it of the stuff that I already did when I, you know, I kind of had the idea of having the fucking CDJ because I think that would look cool. I could even flip it and without the Pioneer CDJs, maybe flip it and do like the Virgil see-through CDJs, right? Those, those were amazing. I'm actually surprised they never ended up releasing them to public to purchase because they were really fucking cool. That see-through, um, what you call it, design or is it trans, let's, let's say trans, call it transparent. Uh, transparent um, design that Virgil did for Pioneer. I don't know why these weren't ever made for retail, but they should have been made for retail. These are absolutely incredible. So he made this, as you can see here, right? These CDJs with a DJ and mixer, um, you know, four CDJs especially, and all in this clear casing, kind of reminding you of like the late, 90s early 2000s trend where a lot of electronics were you know came in like clear cases i remember i had a i actually had an n64 controller there was an n64 controller that was see-through do you guys remember that one it was a controller that was um transparent i think there might have even been a fucking console yeah there we go yeah i had one of these so back in the day i had an n64 controller and you could get a transparent controller with it there was a nokia 8210 that also was transparent, right? Do you remember that one? 8210, transparent, with a transparent case. Back in the day, you could get all of these things. That was a big trend back in the day. You could have transparent cases that go in your phone. And then when somebody calls you, the whole thing lights up like a fucking trick Christmas tree. So I do really like these. So I think I'm going to take the same idea that I've seen Amelion Door do amazingly well with this Queen's Crest Loafer t-shirt and just apply a cdj on the back of it but then i probably would wouldn't put the dj thing in the front maybe just put a cdj on the back of it and it should be fine but that'd be that might be quite cool even this picture here where they actually where it's all lit up that looks pretty cool i really like that picture there design of it with a look at that that looks amazing isn't it? really fucking nice maybe maybe they didn't release them because they're quite hard to kind of figure out how to use maybe without the but without the logos and stuff because there's no logos on the actual casing there's only the logos on the buttons themselves but if you know how to use a CDJ, you'll know automatically that's Q, that's play. You know that's tracks that, you know, one of them is skip, one of them is next track. You know the slider. It's pretty easy to figure it out, you know, the, what do you call it? The um, automatic beat looping is here. It's pretty easy to figure out if you've used CDJs before, but I think it's so really cool. I really fucking like it. I really do. I really, 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 really do. What are you guys saying here? What are you saying? Um, what are you guys saying here? What are you guys saying here? What are you guys saying here? Uh, wait, Austin Casey, what are you saying? Oh, sorry, sorry, my friend. Be up here in the stream chat. If you're enjoying the show, please make sure you like the stream. I can't buy anything on the wish list because they're asking for Ago's address. He needs to create a gift list, which also which will auto send gifts to his address without showing us his. Oh, I need to create what? I need to create a gift list. 
Oh, I see. Not a wish list, a gift. Okay, cool. I need to create a gift list, not a wish list. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that right away. I'll do that right away. Thank you, um, Austin, Katie. Thank you, Koyla, for bringing that to my attention. Apologies. I'm here rambling into the air like a fucking psychopath, and I didn't see what you guys wrote there. Apologies, and I'll get that updated. I'll get that updated. Easy to do. Amazon work will we'll walk you through it. Okay, cool. I'll do it. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate all of you on there. Appreciate you all. Okay, moving on. Um, so we've got that. I spoke about that a little bit. We've also got a really cool tribute, courtesy of Emilion Door, which highlights, um, which highlights uh, <laughs> put a new Chromebook. <laughs> okay, <laughs> big old Kyla. Okay, I'll put a new Chromebook on there. <laughs> I'll put a Chromebook on there. You know what I might put? I might actually put one of those. You know those like bust, those like bum bust. You know those things that guys fuck. It's just like the bum, without the legs, without the torso, just the bum. I might get one of those actually. <laughs> I might put one of those on my list as well. I might put one and put those on my list. All right? Oh, I swear to God, I might put all of that on my list. Oh my god. I swear to god, that would be fucking hilarious. That is definitely what I'm gonna do. But yeah, okay, cool. I'll do that. Once I finish the stream, I'm gonna change that and I'll get that all uploaded on there. But thank you so much, Austin Casey, for the help and obviously Coiro's offer suggestions. Appreciate you guys. So we got another thing. Spring summer twenty twenty four, the world's borough, courtesy, courtesy, courtesy of Emilion Door. This is pretty cool as well, by the way. And um, it features a lot of London peeps. Um again, Emilion Door, I don't really think of it with london right obviously they've got a flagship they've got a store here in a flagship but they have a retail store in london but whenever i think of emily on door i mostly think of new york um but i don't really connect it with london at all but the clothes do look really well in situ right in location they do look pretty good i'm not gonna lie um this is a great photo shoot some faces here you'll probably recognize some you probably won't but the clothes look fucking immaculate really well done just a shame the price tag is what it is right it's like american visvim even though people could say Vism is American, but yeah, everyone looks fucking spectacular wearing the, um, what you would call it, the Amelionda stuff. I love all of it. Everything looks fucking pucker on the people on there. I'm saying pucker because I'm saying English people, of course. But yeah, we've even got Qatari Rio. Look at that. Qatari Rio. Qatari Rio is on there. Saudi Rio is on there flexing some of the Amelionda stuff. So pretty decent. I quite like it. I'm not going to lie. It looks really cool. We've got two sets of twins here as well. Oh, no, not just, oh, two sets of twins, my bad. One set of twins and just two black guys. <laughs> oh, that was fucking wild. I went too fast there. Um, yeah, we've got Declan Rice here also, a few other people. But yeah, pretty cool. I'm not I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it at all. Um, big up the London Massive, Amelionda style. Nice to see, nice to see, nice. It is what it is. It is what it is. Um, let's continue. Next, we got an update courtesy of Neon. The live streamer Leon, who's on kick, has given us an update because last we heard, or I heard on social, he had been arrested in Dubai for filming where he shouldn't have been filming. Now he got on the internet and told people that he's fine. He got released. But he looks a bit worse for wear. Neon looks a bit worse for wear. He's got a bit of a beard. I don't know if he's always this skinny or maybe he's more skinny because he was in pen for a couple of days. But he looks a bit shaken, not stirred. But he does maybe look like he might have learned his lesson. So let's play the clip and see what Neon said about his experience in a Dubai jail. He spent, what, 56 nights in there. Now he's free, home free, right? This is his day, first day out freestyle. Let's hear what he has to say. The country and they made sure once they found out what was happening, I was good. So uh, basically, chat, what happened was um, JCV, the sped, um, you know, you know him, fucking idiot. Um, my cameraman, basically, um, I'm not going to put the blame on him, but... Um, you know, we did some some not good activities there, man. You know, uh, it was not it was not good what we did, and um, we, um, we we were filming in the um, in the areas where, where we're not supposed to film, and it was not a good situation. It was not a good scenario. Uh, it really wasn't. So um, basically, what happened is um, um, what happened, man? Spit out, nigga. What the fuck. Jesus. So basically, what happened Spit is out. um, we were recording in the areas that's not good. 
and um, mm-hmm. where is Sam? Shut up. It was all JCV. Nah, bro, because I put him in the situation. And then, chat, the, the real situation was we, we accidentally filmed the cops, bro. We act, the, the sped, like his eyes were popping wide open filming the cops where he was like excited, bro. I don't know what the fuck he was doing, bro. The idiot filmed the cops. It wasn't his fault. Though. I don't blame him. I take full accountability. It was my fault. And honestly, things could have been a lot worse. But I, I, I really appreciate um, I really appreciate all the people who try to um, who try to make sure I was good, man. A lot of people reaching out. A lot of people. I'm not clone, shut up. But yeah, bro, like, a lot of people were, were there for me and shit. A lot of people reached out. And a lot of people actually went fake on me, bro. A lot of people didn't come out, look out for me, didn't try to help. None of that shit, bro. And, hey, trust me, I know who you are, you pieces of shit. I have very, very small friends, bro. I have a very, very small friend group. I have very small friends. Anyway, you know what's really funny about this situation? Is that, again, I've never been to Dubai. But I'd imagine, although Dubai is really strict, I'd imagine there's pretty a seedy, dark undercurrent to Dubai. It's probably what people would describe as an adult's playground. They have a lot of strict rules, but in most regard, I would imagine you could get up to any number of nonsense you want to get up to out in Dubai. If you've got the means, the resources, the connection, you could probably do whatever the fuck you want. You could probably wear, you could do exactly what you were doing in Vegas, exactly what you're doing in Miami, exactly what you're doing in Ibiza, exactly what you'd be doing in Bali, exactly what you'd be doing in fucking, I don't know, in Jamaica. You could probably do all those things in Dubai if you wanted to. You just have to do it on the low. You can't do it bait in public. So it's a pretty cool place to go to, I'd imagine. Apart from all the human rights, you know, violations and shit, and some slavery issues and whatnot, and other questionable things, right? I imagine it's a pretty decent place to go. But they're very strict. Hey, follow our rules. If you don't follow our rules, you're in big trouble. But if you want to get up to some, you know, some devil stuff, some dark shit, they could probably sort you out. So it really does beg a belief how these kids, how these guys, even though they get given, um, you know, some guardrails, they get given, you know, an idea on what they can and cannot do, they still push the line. And then they get surprised when they get, you know, some very severe consequences. It doesn't make any sense. The only thing that makes sense to me in this regard is that these kids are so warped, they're so smashed in the brain that they actually like the clout of it. This is all part of part of the fun. The fact that everybody's been speculating about where's Neon, did he get arrested, he's been sentenced to a year in prison. They love all of it. For them, it's all a big game. It doesn't really matter, which is wild to think that they are, you know, for them, like, content and clout is everything. So even spending a year in prison is good for them for their brand because they think once they get out it's going to be a whole movie it's going to be a thing it's going to be an event people are going to want to sign them they're going to get loads of viewers loads of donations loads of subs loads of this like bruh are you really willing to play with your freedom for views for virality for engagement is that what you're really doing especially in a country like dubai where like i said if you want to get up to some messy stuff i'm sure it exists these countries that's how they're built that's how they're made to like that's how they exist that's who they're fucking set up for people who want to be discreet but also don't want to do stuff like because there's people out there that want to party like i do in berlin but just not in berlin because berlin's a fucking hellhole it look it looks very soviet it's very central you know european the architecture is very dark and depressing there's graffiti everywhere everybody's smoking everywhere there's shit everywhere so some people like to get up to what I would like to get up to in Berlin, but not just in Berlin settings. So Dubai exists. Those type of nice places where, you know, there might be a bottle girl or two. There might be a, a really good and attentive waitress. There might be a real swanky restaurant with a very high regarded fucking chef there. But if you want to get up to some hanky panky, there's probably some doors you could go to that you could do it in. Just don't do X, Y, and Z. Don't be loud in public. Don't film police. Like It's just some basic rules. But these streamers just don't care. They don't seem to give a fuck. And it's all because of clout, which is a wild place to go to because there's a part of me that's like, I maybe respect that, that they're this hungry for clout, that they're willing to risk their freedom. That shows like, it's like, you know, you're really in it. You're really got some skin in the game because you're willing to throw away your life, your freedom, just so you can be more popular on the internet for like 48 hours, if that. It's pretty wild. But, you know, he's home now so maybe he learned his lesson maybe not who knows i guess the story will continue i guess the story will blood clark continue next on the list we've got this tragic news actually good to see yay okay but this was reported at first as like yay got arrested because he punched some random person but then the actual story came out 
courtesy of Milo, uh, the Yeezy chief of chief of staff, which is a fucking crazy sentence to kind of read. But the co- the comment from Yeezy says as follows regarding the Bianca's incident at Disneyland: A stranger grabbed Bianca is grossly inadequate as a description of what happened. Bianca was physically assaulted. The assailant didn't merely collide into her. He put his hands under her dress, directly on her body, grabbed her waist and spun her around. Then he blew her kisses. She was battered and sexually assaulted. Um, Kanye has been identified as a suspect in a battery case in Los Angeles after allegedly punched a man who grabbed his wife, Bianca Sanzori. It's absurd to stop Ye. Da, da, da. So allegedly, Ye punched some guy at Disneyland for touching his wife. And, you know, I'm all for it. Free Ye. Big W to Ye. I think I've always said before, I think there are some things that every man should be willing to go to prison for. Every man should have a list of things in their brain. Whether it's touching your mom, touching your parents, touching your siblings, your niece, nephews. You should have a thing in your head that you're willing to die for. Even some people are really crazy and they're willing to die for like, you know, their handbags and shit and cars, whatever it may be. I wouldn't go that far. But there should be scenarios in your brain where you're willing to do the time. You're willing to sit down. You're willing to be put in cuffs. You're willing to be put in the back of a meat wagon, whatever. It doesn't matter to you because you have to, you know, you're, it would kill you more not to stand up for somebody that you love or to stand up for something than just to kind of fall for nothing. So in this particular case, I think if, if a man can't be willing to punch some random in the face for touching their wife, then I don't, you know, then you're probably, you, you run the risk of your wife never looking at you the same again. So I definitely understand that. There is conversation have be, that's been had on social, which is wild. I've heard some people on social have a conversation around, oh, maybe Bianca has to change what she wears now. <laughs> that is the height. That is the height of victim blaming, right? That is a quintessential, you know, along the lines of those guys that used to say, oh, um, she wouldn't have got raped. She didn't wear a short skirt. That's insane. Guys should be able to fucking maintain their first, keep their hands to themselves because they see a scantily clad woman walking down the street. Do you know what I mean? Like, she doesn't have to change the way that she dresses to fucking make sure that animals, you know, guys who are not fucking civilized, guys who haven't been brought up correctly, are going to keep their hands to themselves. That's absolutely crazy. I absolutely don't believe in that in the slightest. So, um, big up EA for defending his wife. Love to fucking hear it. Hopefully, he doesn't get any charges and doesn't go, it doesn't get too serious. But I also think he needs to move, maybe move a little bit more correctly. You know, he likes to walk around and, and pretend like he's a regular guy and stuff and go to regular places. But unfortunately, his level of celebrity is just going to always invite creeps and psychos. So maybe they have to, maybe they have to move a bit more clever. But I don't believe that she has to kind of walk down the street in a burqa now to make sure guys don't touch her. Keep your hands to yourself. Don't be a fucking dick. Or if you do, chat shit, get fucking banged. So big up, yay. Big up, blood clot, yay. You love to see it. You love to see it. I thought this was hilarious, by the way, because I saw this comment, actually. Um, where is it? I saw this fucking post. No, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? No, this one. I saw this post, actually, on the Reddit, on the Joe Rogan Reddit, and it got, it's got Bill Maher talking about why he thinks he's lonely or why he's alone, right? Why he's not married. And it's funny because I think I've done this before myself. Like, when you spend a lot of time talking, when you spend a lot of time with yourself, you end up talking to yourself. And sometimes you can give yourself a story, a narrative that almost pats you on the back without patting you on the back. But sometimes when you say it aloud in front of somebody, you sound like a fucking psycho. And this is one of the good examples of it. So I'm sure Bill Maher has said this exact same sentence, this exact same line of thinking in his own head to himself. Yeah. Oh, I mean- oh sorry. And it's made complete sense. But the moment he says it to another person sitting across the room from him, suddenly they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? So listen to Bill Maher talking to Dr. Phil about why he's alone. Honestly, I think all that stuff is sublimation for sex. But that's me. You know, I like I always looked at society and thought, oh, people are golf. I mean, no one really could enjoy it, but OK. Uh, I just feel like if there's things that people do to either get away from their uh, spouse or because they're not getting whatever like charges them up in a marriage. I, I just not because the people aren't great people. It's just because the idea of being with the same person, um, it's got to rob uh, you of like something that was there at the beginning that you then have to watch die. And then you get like snippy with each other, even though it's not each other's fault. (laughs) 
because you <laughs> resent that person from it's blocking <laughs> that thing in your life <laughs> that you know somewhere in your mind was the thing that at one point made you feel the best better than golf better than bowling look at dr phil's better face than whatever look at dr fucking phil's face thing is sublimating it well i still don't know why you haven't got married but i am fully understanding why nobody has ever married you <laughs> <laughs> I totally get that, a hundred percent. Do you really think they fucking kill themselves? Do you really do? You really think a million bitches haven't tried? Yuck! Look at Bill Maher thinking he's some sort of badass. Do you really think a million bitches haven't tried, bro? You're washed, bro. You literally look like a fucking ghost. You look like one of those fucking mannequins in fucking Man Madame Tussaud or Madame Tussaud, wherever that fucking place is, right? Madden, whatever that fucking place is. You look horrendous, bro. No one's queuing up to fucking take your hand in fucking marriage unless they're a fucking city girl. But I love how he's explaining it like, yeah, I bat them away, mate. There's a queue of them outside of my building right now. All right, buddy. Yeah, oh, I'm certain some of them have entertained it. And then no. about a week into it, thought, oh my God. Trust me. And that's the beauty. And that's the hurt. And that's the pain of spending a lot of time with yourself. You seem to you end up justifying some of your nonsense. You end up trying to you end up giving validity to some shit you're saying just because you're saying it. But in the moment you say it to another human being, they look at you like, "Are you absolutely crazy? Can you not see that you are the problem here? Can you not see that you're the issue here? Can you not see that you're the bad guy here? You're not the hero of this story at all in the slightest." And Bill Maher doesn't recognize it, which is kind of wild if you think about it. But you know. The crazy thing is about dudes, though, we don't have a expiry date. So it, technically, there probably is a bunch of girls or women out there that probably would be willing to take, you know, Bill Maher's hand in marriage and shit, which, you know, would probably be a nightmare in itself. Because with all the money and the fame you're going to get from being with Bill Maher, it will come with a, a high, high cost. Because could you imagine, you know, living with a guy day to day? It's going to be exhausting. Living with Bill Maher day to day would be very exhausting for the best of us. So not the greatest way to kind of go about doing things you would imagine but again what do i know what do i bloody know everybody's lonely everybody's doing things it kind of is what it kind of is moving on moving on we've got this clip courtesy of the rolling stone magazine that features the one and only the beautiful ray talking about you know the lack of recognition for songwriters obviously with herself being a songwriter and contributing to some really big hits out there um, i think she's got a lot of credits on the new beyonce cowboy carter album so she's definitely speaking up well for the songwriters out there and to me this is another example as to why the music industry really is hell it really is a sad sadistic cold place and I think a lot of us, if we love artists and stuff, we love music, we have to really kind of give a lot of these artists a lot of praise for even still making music, for even still being around. Because for the most part, most artists aren't making much money. And if they're doing it, most of them are doing it for the love of the game. Most of them are making barely, barely minimum wage, right? And they're literally doing it for the love of the game. Nothing else. They're doing it for pure self-expression reasons just to get their voice out there, just to get their message heard, to spread whatever sounds that they want to spread around the world. But it isn't to be rich and famous because the actual people responsible for writing the tunes, as Ray's going to mention here, don't actually get paid well or at all or even on time. Let's hear Ray talk about standing up for songwriters. There are some incredibly, stupidly, ridiculously talented people who can't pay their rent who are writing these songs and it's incorrect and it's wrong. It is just evil, if I'm gonna be transparent. Mm -hmm. It is so bad what is going on behind the scenes in the music game. And having started as a songwriter, you know, professionally from the ages of about 14 and 15 when I'd started writing, you know, to experiencing just like, wait, so you write the song, but they don't pay you, but they pay the producers. And then you have to wait two years to, to collect pennies and you only make money off radio play? I was like, wait, what? Uh. Which also is affecting the art because then it means that songwriters are like, well, we need to write a radio hit because that's the only way we're gonna make money. And it's dangerous. It's really dangerous also for, for, the, for the quality and the intention of what we're creating as songwriters, you know? 
and it probably explains why music is the way it is at the moment. So for all that needs to be said, there's, you know, James Blake was out here trying to create like a new platform, which was basically another version of Patreon to get people fucking, you know, to get artists money and shit. The main issue at hand, I feel like the music industry is broken because the record labels have a stranglehold on the majority of the money that's coming in for the music. The streaming platforms are in cahoots with the record labels and the artists get a fraction of the money that they make from the fucking record and the other people have to fight for scraps. That's essentially what's happening. So there's something fundamentally wrong with how music is... Because it's a weird place, isn't it? Because music is the only industry where you make something but you don't get the majority of the money that you make that you, for your art. Whereas in every other like art form, you get the majority of the money for the art that you make. But in music, it's not like that. If you make the music, even if you write, produce, you know, mix, master the whole thing yourself, you still end up getting less of a percentage of this thing that you made than the person that publishes it, the person that distributes it, whatever streaming platform is pretty fucking heinous when you think about it. And it is almost downright evil because the people who are creating the work don't get anything from it, don't get any reward. And then it doesn't give you an incentive to create more. And then if you want to create more, you end up creating these horrible pop records that are really microwave cookie cutter shit that nobody needs. But you do it because it's the lowest hanging fruit. It's what people want at the moment. But then it kills you spiritually and creatively. Uh, so it kills you spiritually and obviously creatively. And then obviously for the public, you don't end up creating amazing work that's going to inspire people to make new things. So you're essentially then weirdly in a roundabout way impacting future generations who aren't able to listen to that cool shit that they want to hear from you so it's a cyclical thing it's a horrible situation and the only way to really fix it isn't to create these shitty apps that james blake is doing in collaboration with this company called vault right he did this whole rollout where he was crying and complaining about his songs not being released and then the next week he found this quote-unquote solution which is basically another version of fucking patreon that's not what needs to be done what needs to be done is fixing the actual institutions and structures that already exist so that they favor or that they give more of a lion's share of whatever money that comes in to the people that actually make the art not the people just pressing the buttons or you know in the suits behind the scenes and shit the guys and girls who can't dance no 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 the person that actually makes the art should recreate should receive most of the money from making it um especially if their fans are the ones buying it and stuff and want to you know support them and it's not going to them it's fucking it's fucking heinous it really is heinous so i'm really glad to hear ray talking about it especially given her platform especially given her level of fame especially given her background she hasn't forgotten her roots so it's good to see her speaking up for song and singers and song writers out there because they need to be spoken up for because they need to be spoken up for next on the list i saw this on twitter and i thought this was quite funny because this was like in the background clip of like one of these clips for like the shop i'm sure some of you guys have seen it this um series called the shop right that features um you know all these hip-hop artists i think this particular one has travis scott um ice spice and somebody else and I saw this guy drinking a glass of wine, right? Uh, no, it's not a wine. I guess it's some sort of alcoholic beverage. It's a martini, I think, right? With the uh, olive inside it. But I thought it was a wine. Anyway, regardless, when I saw this, it immediately made me think of LeBron James and his obsession with wine. And just in general, it made me think of like black people and their obsession with wine anyway in general. This new like trend of like everybody drinking red wine. At some point, I was thinking to myself, are all these people drinking red wine because they think it gives them like IQ points or something? Are they drinking this red wine because it makes them look cultured? It's almost like, you know, it's like smoking a cigar or something. Or do they really think it's that tasty? Because, you know, I've had some good red wine in my time, but I wouldn't think it was tasty to go through like that many bottles and get that. It's not that great. It usually sends you to sleep. You get horrible, like marble wino mouth when you drink too much of it. It's, no, it's just a strange thing that's become like very trendy. Like all these black people being really into drinking, you know, Chardonnays and shit and red wines and organic wines, natural. It's like, bruh, really? Can't you get yourself a Jaeger? Can't you get yourself a fucking Jack Daniels and take that to the fucking face? Do you really, really, really think wine is that tasty? Like, is that for real? Is that a real thing? Or are you just trying to, you know flick your little pinky up and make you look like you're sophisticated like, look who drinks a drink like that like who does that Do, are you really doing that on purpose is that how you really drink your fucking martini with your little pinky up that way or are you trying to you know act like you're sophisticated in some regard it's just a little bit redacted i don't like it. it's a bit too try hardy it's a bit nonsensey and if anything it doesn't improve 
the drinking experience. If anything, it just makes me look like a wallad. But again, what do I know? I could be hating. What do I know? I could be hating. I'm not hating. I could be hating. You never fucking know. So let's talk about the main thing I want to talk about today, which is Grimes' Coachella performance. Grimes at Coachella. I'm still processing it because it was a pretty shocking thing to see play out in real time because it almost i don't know if you saw the whole set it actually started off pretty okay she turned up on set in some like weird motorized spider gizmo type of shit she looks amazing coming on stage it was actually quite a good set i'm not gonna lie the set was pretty decent and from what i remember watching it in the background when i was doing my shit i guess she thought it was quite decent and in the middle obviously things went fucking haywire so i'm gonna play a clip for you that shows you um, Grimes going through some difficult time out there playing at Coachella. And obviously, I'm going to comment on what actually happened and some of the backlash. This shit always fucking happens. All my tracks are twice as fast. So I'm not mixing very well. But I'm going to keep trying. And I appreciate you guys being here. <laughs> there has never been a Grimes show without a major technical difficulty. But. Just play the tune, you fucking no, donut. Not my fault. Well, partially my fault. But it's not entirely my fault. So. This is insane. All my tracks are double the tempo. And they're like. <laughs> I'm trying to do the math. Uh, if we can't. I'm trying to do the math. Look at this girl. Where all the song tempos are double speed. And Look I at this girl. I've not practiced the math. Just press the fucking the button and it but takes I them off, you to, dickhead. I am going to handle this. All right. Let's try this again. Y'all, don't judge me for being bad at calculating things. This is worse than Frank Ocean. This is worse than Frank Ocean. Is not a sin. What the fuck? That was actually me. That time that was actually me. Okay. Okay, you get the gist. She was a fucking horror show. Um, and what needs to be said about this? I've always had the feeling anyway that... Hmm. I've always had the feeling that the, the, the worst DJs in the world have way more in common, the worst DJs in the world that never get paid to book play anywhere have way more in common with the DJs that get paid the most at the top end. I feel like there's a way more, you know, overlap in their style of play, in their attitude towards DJing with the people at the very bottom and the people at the very top. But I think the people in the middle are better than the majority of the people at the top. But the majority of people at the top make all the money. So all the money gets squeezed up to the top and there's the rest of it, everyone else has to kind of fight for the scraps. But the guys in the middle, the guys and girls in the middle are the ones that are sick. The ones at the top aren't so. But in this particular case, this isn't one of them. This is just somebody not practicing, not taking their set seriously and doing the bare minimum. Because in this scenario, there is no reason why she would have turned up to this set at Coachella playing on pioneer cdjs industry standard pioneer you know mixer industry standard probably pioneer head whatever right industry standard gear that she's already used to nothing in that setup is shocking or new to her even if you've got a fucking you know two channel controller from pioneer at home they work in a similar type of way especially if you want if you have a standalone xdj one so nothing would have been a surprise for her there it's only a surprise because she hasn't practiced at all. She hasn't touched a turntable since she got booked to play at Coachella. 
She didn't once go through her set list. Maybe she went through her set list in Record Box and just reordered some of the tunes because Record Box is the is the you is the kind of is a program you use to kind of um, make sure that your records are sequenced and programmed and beat match properly and whatever, so that when you play them on the CDJs, they get recognized and you can mix them and shit. So she most likely made a playlist on Record Box. I can believe that, but I don't think Grimes spent a single minute practicing that set, which is quite crazy when you think about it. Because I'm an up-and-coming DJ. I do my thing in my local fucking circuit, just in pubs and bars, nowhere crazy. And I practice my sets. <laughs> I'm playing for people who don't want me to be there. Most of them are, have their backs turned to me. They're stuffing their face with burgers and fucking chips covered in ketchup. I'm getting paid $50, maybe $150 on a good day, at most. And I'm practicing my set before I go. I'm running, I'm, I'm putting it in record box as a playlist. I'm running it through my MIDI player to listen to it. I might even book a pirate session and play it out loud to hear how the songs sound. And then I might reorder some things or change some things around or just scrap the whole set. There's been even occasions when I was playing in this particular pub in where I live, near where I live, where we had this quote unquote residency, or as Brennan would say, we had a residency where we'd play every Friday and every Saturday. Pretty good you know, I think occasion because it got me to play in front of people, even though it was a pub, it's still important to play in front of fucking human beings because unfortunately DJing, you can't just do it at home alone. You have to kind of play in front of people to kind of get better. That's how you really, you know, understand, you know, how to read a crowd, where to go when, when, when you're in certain places, how to get a crowd like amped up, how to bring them down, blah, blah, blah. And just improve even your technical skills under that pressure it kind of really helps a lot better to kind of it kind of imp you know quickens your learning curve than playing at home so i've had occasions when i'm playing in a pub every friday and saturday and i've never repeated a set i would purposely go home and re-download a whole bunch of new songs a whole bunch of other songs to dig through and go through the entire thing and this is playing at pub sets so i'm sure if i'm doing this much effort playing for gigs where i'm getting paid 150 dollars i'm sure there's guys and girls out there who are doing far more than me they're getting paid 500 euros and they would jump at the opportunity to do this set and here's grimes one of the biggest stages in the world festival wise great profile with the match. even for someone like grimes who's amazing she goes on there she does the bare minimum doesn't try doesn't practice then tries to blame it on an assistant and somebody else that did it throw them under the bus of course no no fucking accountability at all and if anything, looking at those clips anyway, she made the situation far worse by shouting and apologizing on the screen, on the, on the microphone. Like, illegitimately was, un, you know, unsettling. It was annoying. She kind of killed the vibe because she just kept going on and pointing out the mistake. Sometimes barreling through and just kind of getting through it and jumping into the next tune. Okay, I fucked up that mix. Let's jump to the next one. Works. I've played in places where sometimes the left tempo slider on the CDJ that doesn't work. So effectively, you can't mix out of that left-hand side. You have to just mix out the right-hand side. Okay, cool, whatever. You make it work. Or sometimes the mixer doesn't really work. You make that work as well. So I think the whole thing is just a representation of just how little care, attention that she put into that set. She didn't practice. She didn't run through her songs. She did nothing. And there's real lack of technical know-how about how to use the equipment. Because that issue that she has with the double speed thing could be sip, sorted out with a couple clicks on the CDJ. If you used it before, you'd know exactly what to click to make sure that double speed thing that she's complaining about goes away. It's not too difficult. And the fact that she's screaming and crying about on stage is absolutely crazy. And I've seen some people online changes discourse into oh this is why female dj should never get booked in places but i think she's very unique in her not giving a fuckness and also being a complete waste of time because i also can't wrangle in my head how this is the same grimes that made fucking visions the same grimes that made art angel art angel sorry i can't figure it in my mind like how is was was that all that stuff ghost produced because how was she this dumb but then she created two of the most important albums in modern history like, like legitimately those albums probably remain or belong in the album hall of fame they will probably be in those like rolling stones greatest albums of the last 20 years 20 you know in, in the 20th in the 21st century or whatever right in our angels and fucking visions how does somebody that creates those albums how are they how how can somebody make those two albums 
not be able to play on a pair of CDJs. And CDJs nowadays are so advanced, especially the higher up ones, around 3,000 plus, whatever they are, it's impossible to fuck them up, especially with the sync buttons, especially with little tricks that you can do. It's really hard to fuck up a set. The only way you can fuck up a set is the sequencing of the tunes. You go from maybe one really fast one, one really slow, like, you know, you don't really get the sequencing right. Or sometimes you don't go as far as mixing in key, whatever it may be. But at this level, for an artist of her caliber, not to be able to play on CDJs is fucking a nightmare. It also makes it funnier when you think about how much she's been pushing the whole AI thing in music. She's pushing the whole AI thing in music, but I think you could run an AI script of some regard to mix that set that she did better than she did it herself. So in some ways, in some ways, the person that's screaming the most for AI, they're probably the one that's going to be replaced the quickest because she's a shadow of her former self. It's pretty embarrassing to say. I'm not going to lie. It's pretty embarrassing. I heard they did cut her step short. I didn't watch towards the end. I heard they did cut it short, which makes sense because, you know, you can't have somebody just screaming over the microphone on that sort of stage. That's like just meant for fucking people dancing and singing, having a good time. And here she is with her fucking really weaselly, you know, nasally fucking annoying voice screaming. And it's also nuts to think about. This woman has three kids, doesn't she? With Elon Musk. Like this woman's a mum. That's a wild thing to think about. Like, she's not even like, you know, this sort of act was cute when she was literally in her early 20s, but she's a mum. So it's not even cute anymore. You kind of just look a bit sad, you know? Like, to take the opportunity and then not do right by it and not kind of show out. It's a really strange situation to kind of see. Now, she's got a chance to redeem herself because the Coachella lineup mirrors itself and repeats the following weekend. So she has a chance to redeem herself this weekend. Will she do that? Who knows? Will the Coachella people say, you know what? We're good on you. We're all set on fucking Grimes. You can go away. Or will she get a chance to redeem herself? I'm not really too sure. All you have to do to redeem herself, really, is just make sure she plays all the songs in sequence, one by one. No one's asking for her to mix them. No one's asking for her to add effects and go crazy, scratching, wheel ups. Nah, just play your songs one after the other, please, if you don't mind. Load them up, you know. And they keep it going from there because apart from that, she's fucking useless. It's absolutely insane to see how useless she is. But for someone like myself, I become a DJ. It gives me hope. It encourages me because it lets me know that thinking, that feeling I always had about these guys aren't practicing. These guys aren't record digging. Like, and again, this is maybe it's a passion thing as well. Maybe it's like a comfortability thing. If you're a DJ like she is and she's probably got paid, let's say anywhere between like 50 to 100,000 for this set. It's really hard to give a fuck as much as I'm giving a fuck, right? Because although the 150 pounds for my drink token or whatever is not, you know, a big deal, it's still cool to go and play. So I'm literally going there to play where I'm playing with a sense of like glee, right? I'm actually excited to go. Maybe these guys aren't excited. Maybe they're going through the motions because it's literally a job. But I still think if that's the case, you still need to respect your job. I've I've come to that realization in my in my later years that I was really, you know, flipping and just obtuse and a bit of a dickhead when it came to jobs. I take them, I wouldn't take them seriously because I always felt like they were beneath me. But it's like, no, no, no. Always respect the position you're at at the moment. The other stuff think about later, but always respect the position you're at in that moment. Don't take it for granted. And I think people like her have taken it for granted because again, she made a seminal piece of work a monumental piece of work that will go down in history in our angels and visions but ever since then it's been fucking downhill and she's really been coasting along on her reputation only because i don't think i've ever heard a a new grimes album since our angels probably not heard a single one so maybe that is the case that she's been coasting on that early popularity when she was you know somewhat popular back in those days but jesus christ man this set was fucking crazy um, hearing it play in the background when she's fucking fucking it up with the fucking selections and the uh, supposed beat grids and the double time BPM. I'm like, God almighty, bro. How can you not like not being able to go through a set before you play such a big gig does makes absolutely no sense to me. But you know, some people are pieces of shit. Some people are absolute pieces of shit and they don't take anything seriously. And they, they get surprised when suddenly the opportunities fucking dry up again. They get absolutely surprised. They're like, oh my God, I had no idea this was going to happen. It's like, bruh, bruh, come on. Come on, bruh. Have some fucking shame. 
Next, we've got this clip courtesy of um, the CEO podcast, I think, featuring Tim Dillon. It's a really funny one where Tim Dillon has a very interesting description of influencers. Let me play this for you. Seems like, and again, not to be overly dramatic about it, but it, people are looking at it like an apocalyptic event because there are jobs that when we look at how profoundly AI is going to impact the business that just simply won't exist. Um, you know, we have AI influencers now that are actually, because we've bred in this country some of the least interesting people on the planet and some of the most interesting, but some of the least interesting people, the most generic people are making millions and millions of dollars, essentially just hawking products on the internet. That's all they do. They go, someone asked me about my skincare routine and I thought I would share <laughs> something with you guys. I'd share a promo code <laughs> with you guys because a lot of people come up to me and they go, your skin is really glistening. It looks really good. So I'm really excited to share this promo. And, and so those people don't need to exist. In fact, they really don't. They don't exist as human beings. So they need to be just replaced by a pixelated version of that, an AI version of that. There's apps now going from Robert De Niro to AI. That's going to be a thing. Going from you know uh, uh, Tina Turner to AI. That's a big deal. Going from these people, these generic barcodes with feet, these promo codes. Going from them to AI <laughs> is going to be literally unnoticeable. And he's right. He's right. And it's unfortunate because I've always said that. The influencer scene, culture, industry is not what it should be. Because the very, you know, when I remember influencers becoming a thing or when I first got into streetwear, influencers were basically, you know, consumers. They were addicts. They were shopping addicts. They were guys and girls that love just buying new shit, experimenting with a new brand, checking out this new place to go and vacationing you know booking to stay at this brand new hotel whatever they just try shit off their own back with their own money and then brandon recognized them trying shit and then reach out or they'd get fucking sponsored to go and check something out and be invited hey come and see our new thing whatever it may be but it was mostly people doing it out of the love out of love for the game nowadays that's not a thing nowadays people only influence things that people give them for free or pay them to fucking influence and promote and market which doesn't really seem like influencing it just seems like regular old marketing to me right regular old advertising regular old endorsements but they try to spin it like it's marketing like it's influencing like it's coming from them like oh i love these jeans which you'd never heard of yesterday i love these shoes which you never heard until today that's what i don't like about the influencer scene it's become way too commodified right it's become way too commercial the fun of like exploring and finding cool interesting things that you want to share with your audience has completely gone now because everybody's thinking about it with a monetary gain at the end of it that's all they're thinking they're not thinking about it about hey let's try and get you know more of these in, more of these stuff in people's in front of people's eyes let's expose this brand Let's highlight this to people. Let's highlight this service. It needs more eyes, attention to it. Now, nah, it's all about the fucking clout online and obviously, you know, having your name be noteworthy. But I would love it if the, if the kind of resurgence of AI actually spearheaded a change and we went back to the old school way of how influencers were, where influencers were influencing people via their own, you know, buying habits and decisions and shit. And it wasn't because they got sponsored by hashtag yoga company. You know what I mean? That's what I would love to see happening in the future. Would it would it happen? Probably unlikely because these guys would make way too much money being the fake, oh, I've always loved this product, use my promo code type of thing. It's just too much easy money not to kind of take it. So most likely the incentive isn't there. But I think it's no surprise that companies now are, you know, refusing to work with those type of big level, you know, influencers and they're preferring to work with the quote unquote micro ones because they're quote unquote easy to handle and they understand the job. I mean, they understand what needs to be done and the other ones usually don't. But hey, what do I know when it comes to this stuff? I really like, you know, his just description of fucking influencers in general saying they are walking, what did they're barcodes with feet. That's an amazing line. Influencers nowadays are barcodes with feet. That to me was a freaking, freaking amazing line. Okay, my friends. I want to continue on here with the last post I wanted to talk about regarding whore and Palestine. So whore, 
the Berlin based um, live streaming radio DJ platform thingy that everybody's obsessed with, myself included, well, was obsessed with. Now it's kind of gone to shit because everybody's kind of boycotted the thing and it's not as great as it once was. They decided to put together this compilation CD that's going to be sold on Bandcamp and all the proceeds, proceeds will go to a Palestinian charity called Hill. And obviously, they're getting a lot of backlash for this because if you remember back in the day, Hall was a platform that went out of their way to de-platform people who were you know posting support for palestinians during the infancy of the genocide that's going over there in gaza i still can't get my head around why the whole radio people thought it would be a good idea to tell people to remove certain garb as they were playing in their little toilet thing they should have known that that was a big on goal they should have never told people hey don't put that shirt on and shit that's fucking ridiculous um the moment they kind of did that they became an enemy of the people, especially a lot of the politically motivated, politically minded, um, you know, politically active people within the DJ scene. And just the regular people who have a sense of humanity, who were seeing the horrors that were fucking happening in Gaza and were calling for a ceasefire and shit. Now that the, you know, the tide has somewhat changed on Israel, especially, you know, because of the random, um, you know, drone strikes on civilians that people have been seeing, the open mass graves and whatever. The narrative and the kind of sentiment around Israel and what they're doing in palestine has completely changed so that's why now we're seeing a lot more you know respite from the soldiers and shit in pictures and stuff and we're seeing you know i would say the tide turn but it definitely isn't as bad maybe it was a few weeks ago it's still obviously it was horrible but it's not as bad anyway all that to say this compilation has been received very negatively because whore were very adamant about deplatforming people who are supporting palestine but it's done in a such a haphazard heavy-handed way it almost feels like a troll you know that's the funny thing about it because it almost feels like a troll how haphazard is done because we all remember how they acted when people were going on hall wearing palestinian scarves and shit and t-shirts now to stand around and act like they are for palestine is crazy now the other side of it could be this maybe this is the redemption arc they needed maybe they needed to do something to change something and although you know they probably wouldn't go to the raid they won't listen to the music just them doing the exercise just them do just them acknowledging sorry the compilation itself is a good thing maybe people seeing it will make them somewhat you know acknowledge what's happening make them more politically active change the conversation who knows i don't think it will personally but who fucking knows i personally think it's very ill you know ill-advised a strange thing to do doesn't really make any sense doesn't really sort anything and if anything it just upsets the climate again when things were kind of settling down and people were really starting to do some things that were affecting some change so for her to pop up and try and like you know play themselves in the middle of this and make them look like good samaritans is fucking wild but i also feel like people should once they give them a break but more so that hey they've made a position very clear they obviously don't give a shit about palestinians anyway so ever, anything they do is definitely going to be performative and a bit you know whatever but they did it anyway that's okay but if they're free to do what they want to do with this compilation you as a fan are free to tell them to go fuck themselves without it being like anything more than that and i think that's perfectly fine but if you read through the comments people have some very strong opinions behind this whole thing so let's read through it so um somebody said here hold up weren't you the one who shut down anyone showing support for palestine recently we all know you were another person says the people in the comments who are down wondering where the support is for israel israel is supported by the us and with with literally billions of dollars meanwhile palestine has been almost blown off the map by israel killing tens of thousands of innocent women and children how can you people not see the difference another person says who has declined every ceasefire deal put on the table Another person says, it's about time, but please let's not forget that Hall were cancelling Palestinian artists not too long ago for saying the same thing. It's great that they now support the cause, but take accountability for your past actions. This I don't agree with. There's no accountability they can take because they fundamentally don't give a fuck. That's what people don't understand. The Hall founders don't give a fuck, for better or worse. Um, and I would imagine they're also legitimately conflicted because aren't the founders of Hall Israeli? didn't one of them serve in the idf if that's the case why do you expect them to disavow take account like it's not going to happen because there obviously is you know some split loyalties there there obviously is a they have skin in the game to some level you know for lack of a better term 
So either you accept this, you know, performative, empty gesture or not. But this idea of like take cans of it, it's never going to happen. That first apology they tried to do didn't work. They tried to send the email, didn't like, it was all fucking nonsense because at the heart of it, they don't give a fuck. It continues. There are 150 hostages in Gaza right now. Kids, women, what about them? So obviously some Israelis are not happy with Hor for like deciding to change their stance. Another person says, what about the rapists that got murdered <laughs> by the extremists? The war is, is hell on both sides. Eh, I don't really think so. I think one side definitely is doing a lot more of the killing. Another one says, y'all waited for 34,000 people to be executed for this. Basic. Another person says, a change of heart or convenience unsubscribing now what about hall for peace so many zionists here not surprised free palestine i've always i'm not gonna lie i've always had a really bad taste in my mouth about the whole like rave for so-and-so place going through hard times especially if they're in like a photo of countries and shit because half that money doesn't go back to them anyway and it's such a weird empty gesture i think that's why i've always said i think in general raving or dance music platforms whether they be sites that sell music whether they be you know, live streaming platforms, whatever they are, I think they should just be apolitical or just be a neutral space where you don't interfere with people's expression of their politics and shit or activism. You let people say what the fuck they want to say within, you know, within reason and go from there. But it's policing or one people can say this, 10% can't say that, it always leads to trouble. That's the main crux of it because, you know, at the end of the day, it's only raving. Raving is not going to solve anything in Palestine. It's a nice gesture, but then, you know, putting it behind all this stuff is fucking gross let's continue another one says kind of off to call for a permanent ceasefire when hamza when hamas sorry just declined one just since they don't have enough living hostages another one says israeli jew here support your guys whole berlin proud of you so much for choosing the right side of history another one says we won't forget the few months we were cancelling pro-palestinian shows free palestine i want whole for nova survivors why did y'all wait so long lmao broke like six months late Fair enough to support both sides, but you didn't say that Jewish Israeli creators had been disc discriminated since the war started. You're right for the Palestinian, right for your self determination, but whore for Palestine? Where's whore for never? Whore for fighting anti Semitism? You change your petition quite easily, especially when Hamas is declining ceasefire deals again and again. You could go and your opinion is valid, but stick to it periodically in a way that makes anyone sense rather than what is right financial decision for your studio. So clearly people are not happy with their, you know, what Paul are trying to do. They're trying to make some amends for what they did previously, but I just think it was so ill-fated. It was so fucking tone deaf and shit. I just don't think there's no coming back from that sort of stuff. You know, that's going to take more than a picture, more than the snazzy caption and more than some cool graphics for a fucking compilation that no one's going to listen to. For a compilation that no one is going to listen to. But again, what do I know? What do I know? Anyways, my friends, I'm going to have to love you and leave you. That has been the episode number six. 766 sorry of the agassino zinger show 766 of the agassino zinger show thank you so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if you're watching this live stream please make sure you smash the like button down below give it some love if you are going to watch the audio or if you want to listen to the audio stream and you're listening to it now make sure you leave me a five star review that'd be greatly appreciated and for those of you listening to the audio side of the stream you will hear my tune today my tune today is from the one and only nia archives new album coming out or new album already out jungle breakbeat inspired you know the deal um one of our best producers here in london and i've really figured out today she's only fucking 24 years old so her ceiling is going to be crazy i can't wait to see what she makes in five years time this girl is really talented so i want you to check out an album by nia archives Nia Blood Claw Archives and the tune I'm going to be playing will be Crowded Rooms, right? I'll be playing Crowded Rooms by Nia Archives. Check her out. She's fucking banging. Really cool. Love her fucking music. You can see her kind of features, I think, here on the screen if you're paying attention to it. Um, Silence is Loud. That's the album. You can definitely check it out. It's really fucking good. Nia Archives, Crowded Rooms is playing now underneath my fucking voice and I'll see the rest of you guys very, very soon. But for now, take care, my friends. Take care, my friends.